Today on CityCast Philly, it's the Friday News Roundup. We're talking about the recent jailbreak, a post-election debrief, and the Fairmount Park Conservancy's Love Your Park Week. It's Friday, May 19th. I'm Trinae Nuri, and here's what Philly's talking about. Joining me this week is Chris Palmer, criminal justice and law enforcement reporter at the Philadelphia Inquirer. Hey, Chris. Morning. And Lauren Christella, interim president and chief operating officer at the Committee of 70. Glad to have you back. Thanks for having me. Before we get into the news of the week, you know, I've got my icebreaker. May 19th is National Pizza Party Day, if you didn't know. So I have to ask y'all, where is your favorite place in the city to grab a slice or a pie? I'll go first. We are big fans of Pizzeria Stella in our neighborhood in South Philly. Uh, My kids' favorite spot for sure. Awesome. What about you, Chris? Pizzeria Stella is a really good one. I used to live down in that neighborhood and would go there all the time. I am partial to Pizza Shack and Maxon in Fishtown. Really good slices and really big slices, too. So I'm, I'm a fan. That's great. If I'm downtown, I love going to Joe's Pizza Philly, which is located on 122 South 16th Street. Pie is bigger, bigger than your face. <laughs> and they also have like inside seating. So, it, you know, it's perfect for a pizza party. And I used to live in the uh, sh- like near Brewery Town, Strawberry Mansion area. Um, so I used to love going down to uh, down north at 2804 Lehigh Avenue. They have like the pizzas that are square and it's like really, really dense topping. So you definitely you need friends to help you eat that pizza. <laughs> and speaking of pizza, pizza is like a staple for journalists on election night. Right. And so we'll we'll talk more about election night later in the show. But first, let's get back into the, the top news this week, Chris. You've been following and covering this story about two men escaping from the Philadelphia Industrial Correctional Center on May 7th. So it's been about more than 10 days. Can you take us back and how did how did this happen? How can two people escape from jail? That is a really good question and one that I think is still, despite a lot of developments over the past 10 days, I think is still under investigation. There's a lot we know now that we didn't 10 days ago, but there's still quite a bit that I think law enforcement is trying to sort out. What we do know and what authorities have said has happened is that around 8.30 on Sunday, May 7th, there were two men who were at the jail awaiting trial who broke out. Two men were Amin Hurst. He's an 18-year-old who was jailed awaiting trial. He was accused of four murders, two shootings, several robberies, and some other crimes and Nasir Grant, who is a 24-year-old who was awaiting trial on gun and drug charges. Police and prosecutors now say they essentially got out of their cells at some time before 8.30. They got into a jail yard that was outside of the wing where they were staying, and they essentially snuck through a hole in the fence. They then climbed over two additional fences, got off of the jail grounds, and went on the run for a few days. What was most shocking about this at the time, beyond the fact that they managed to escape, was that it went undetected for almost 19 hours, that no one in the jails knew about it. Right. That that struck me, too. Yeah. Union officials who represent corrections officers said that this is in part because of an ongoing staffing crisis at the jails. They say that there was extremely low staffing levels at the time of the breakout. And what the union has said and what someone close to an investigation has told us that seems to be true is that there were several hours when that unit where these men were housed, where there was no guard there at all. There were supposed to be rotating guards who checked on the unit, but no one assigned to it. And then two other critical posts outside, they said were also unmanned. The prisons commissioner has denied that there was a complete absence of staff anywhere in the jail at the time, but has acknowledged that they're trying to investigate where exactly correctional staff were at the time the breakout happened. Chris, do we know, like, when's the last time someone escaped from a Philly jail? I've been at the Inquirer for 10 years. I've been covering this beat for eight years. I haven't heard of anything resembling this before. Mm -hmm. There may be instances where prisoners, you know, either got out to different units or 
been places they weren't supposed to, but having two people escape for several days, particularly given the gravity of the charges these men are accused of, I, I haven't heard of anything like this in my time uh, in the city. And, you know, these individuals got help. What's next for all of the individuals who were a part of this escape? Yeah, so over the past 10 days or so, I think, first of all, it's important to say both men have since been rearrested. Uh, Nasir Grant was arrested last Thursday in North Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. Police said he was disguised in women's clothing as he was getting a ride somewhere. I mean, Hearst was rearrested on Wednesday this week. After about 10 days, the U.S. Marshals said his family had actually gotten in contact with them to negotiate a surrender. And after he didn't show up at three different deadlines, they ended up arresting him in West Philadelphia. Police have also charged four additional people now with providing some level of aid. They said there was a 21-year-old woman who took recorded jail phone calls from Amin Hearst to try and set up transportation from them once they got out. There was a another prisoner who allegedly served as a lookout and provided kind of a thumbs up when the coast was clear. And then two men who authorities say basically helped Amin Hearst while he was on the run. All of them are now jailed and awaiting a preliminary hearing on charges, including escape, hindering apprehension, conspiracy, and other and other charges. But there's still an investigation ongoing. I think there are still questions about whether anyone else is involved, including if any, you know, jail staffers was involved or if this was simply kind of a crime of opportunity by the people who managed to get out. And also I read in NBC 10 that a 28-year-old man was stabbed at the same facility this week. Yeah, that's right. The, the jails for for a long time, but particularly over the past two years, have been going through what some advocates and prisoners and other officials have described as something of a crisis. Particularly since COVID, there has been elevated levels of assaults, of inmate deaths, the corrections officer staffing crisis has become particularly acute. The The union this month held a vote of no confidence in the prison commissioner's leadership because they're about 40% short of a full staffing complement, which they say is a, is a public safety threat and a human rights issue for both for the prisoners who are inside, but also the corrections officers who have to work there. So there are unfortunately frequent reports of, of stabbings, of beatings. There have been homicides in the jails. And in fact, I mean, Hearst, one of the escapees, one of the murders he was jailed for and is accused of is actually shooting and killing someone who had just been released from prison about an hour before a different facility. They said he, I mean, Hearst targeted someone that he thought was going to be coming out of jail. He shot this man as he came out. It turns out it was the wrong person. But it just gives you a sense of how there have been all kinds of troubling issues coming up at the jails over the past few years. Another major story this week was the election going into Tuesday's primary. There were four to five candidates who really looked competitive to be the Democratic nominee for mayor. But then we had the votes were coming in and... It came in for former council member Sherelle Parker, and she took a lead far out of the pack and became victorious. Lauren, tell us, how did voter turnout impact this primary? So this is uh, one of the lower turnout races we've seen in in recent primaries. Uh, They all hover about 30 percent. This looks like it's going to be about 27, maybe 28 percent turnout. But the Crowded field certainly played a played a part in this as well. So we had about twenty percent, fifteen to twenty percent of voters going into election day saying they were undecided. And with so many competitive candidates at the top of the pack, you saw a real plurality of votes for sure. But of course, Sherelle Parker winning with about a third of the vote, thirty three percent. Lauren, Committee of 70 had a poll and it said it would be a very, very close race. But Sherelle like went far beyond, I guess, what was anticipated, right? I think the headline from our poll was that 20 percent were still undecided and that the the people who knew who they were voting for were kind of evenly split across the top four. So the 20 percent is obviously going to you know, make their choices at the at the booth on Election Day. And I think that's what we saw happening People definitely were trying to vote strategically. And I think Sherelle Parker was really able to mobilize a strong ground game 
that led to turnout in the voting blocks that were overwhelmingly supportive of her. What does this also say about maybe some of the issues that voters care about, like quality of life or gun violence concerns? Because Parker, um, from some reporting um, in the Enquirer, Parker did really well in some neighborhoods that see a lot of gun violence. Crime and gun violence was definitely the top issue for most voters. I think there was a survey that said nine out of 10 listed it as their top priority going into this election. Each candidate did put forward a plan to address gun violence and and several with plans for what they would do in the first hundred days. And it's clear that Sherelle Parker's plan for addressing gun violence really resonated with the communities most affected by it. Now, these candidates, they were really engaged with voter forums and debates. I saw that someone even participated in a mock election with some young folks. Do you know what the future is for the candidates who didn't make it? Many of them have years of political experience. Yes, I think it's going to be very exciting to see where each of the candidates goes from here. You know, we have a resign to run rule in Philadelphia. So several of these candidates resigned their seats on city council to be able to run for office. I'm sure some of them will return to the private sector, but others are certainly going to be continuing their public service and looking for avenues to contribute to the civic life of Philadelphia. Lauren, what should voters pay attention to for the November general election? Lots to pay attention to for the November general election. People should definitely not think that this was the whole ball game. Right. One, we have other races on the ballot in the fall. So uh, there's going to be a competitive city commissioner's race, all the judicial candidates, right? Those those elections really matter and will affect yeah. the day-to-day life of Philadelphians. But as far as the mayor's race goes, Sherelle Parker's squaring off against David O. And of course, that seven to one Democratic edge in voter registrations certainly makes it seem likely that she will win the, the, the mayor's race in the fall. But I think that voters should be paying attention to the specifics now, asking the candidates. There's only two. They'll have much more than one minute to speak on on each of these issues like we saw at all of those forums you mentioned, but really asking for specifics about their plans to address the crime issue and quality of life and public education. Yeah. And speaking of those issues, most Philadelphians think that the city is on the wrong track, according to a recent Lenfest Institute poll. And it'll still be a while before we have a new mayor. So, Lauren, what can people do now between Election Day or even Inauguration Day to shape how the next mayoral administration will work? It is very hard, I think, for voters who get very excited about Election Day in May to have to then sit and wait for the change that they so desperately want until January. But they definitely should know that there is a ton of work that they can be doing now and things that they could be paying attention to and questions to ask the campaign. For both the the Republican and the Democrat, for Sherelle Parker and David O, their transition work starts now, right? They're, They're building teams. They're coming up with specific proposals. They're thinking through what their staffing might be, what the shape of their government might be. So the Committee of 70 is interested in a public version of that as well. So a way to get the the public involved. So stay tuned to 70.org and our social media channels for ways to get involved in that transition process. But then also get involved with the groups that care about these issues, right? There's a, a ton of groups focused on increasing funding and access and equity in our schools, gun violence prevention groups, right? The Coalition to Save Lives is doing a ton of work and could use public support for sure. So so if there's issues that you care about and you want to see change now, go find the groups that are focused on them and figure out a way to work with this new administration. Now, before we head into the weekend, I want to give some good news. Philly park season has begun. Philadelphians are cleaning up for the Fairmount Park Conservancy's Love Your Park Week, which runs through May 21st. So volunteers are picking up trash, collecting leaves for composting, and some people are even going to plant trees at more than 90 parks. Philly has one of the largest urban park systems in the world, and you can actually listen to a CityCast Philly episode that we did a few weeks back about your guide to all the fun activities you can get into this season at Fairmount Park. We'll have a link in our show notes. All right, Chris Palmer, criminal justice and law enforcement reporter at the Philadelphia Inquirer. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. 
and Lauren Cristella, Interim President and Chief Operating Officer at the Committee of 70. Thank you for joining me this week. Thank you. It was great to be here. It's time for the tip of the week, where we share a life hack for living in Philly. Now, speaking of election season, here's some important deadlines you should know for the November general election. Monday, October 23rd, is the last day to register for that election. Tuesday, October 31st, is the last day to apply for a mail-in or civilian absentee ballot. Tuesday, November 7th, is election day. Every registered voter can participate. If you have a tip of the week, we'd love to hear from you, too. Call or text us at 215-259-8170. That's all for today here on CityCast Philly. Our lead producer is Laura Benchoff. Our producer is Abby Fritz. Our Hey Philly newsletter editor is Brittany Valentine. And our host is me, Trine Nuri. Music is by Philly's own Interminable with additional music from All the Kimonos and James Weldon. If you enjoy this week of episodes, please tell a friend, rate the show, leave us a review, and subscribe to our morning newsletter, Hey Philly. We'll be back Monday morning with more news from around the city. Have a great weekend and be safe. Bye.